Hi, my name is Guy Gronwald from Gronwald Fur and Wool Company, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for having me speak about the present state of the uh, wool business around the world. Um, most of you know uh, probably our company and uh, probably have some idea who I am, but um, I'm a third generation uh, running a wool buying company in Illinois, and we buy from about 25 states, and uh, we market wool uh, throughout the world. Um, to start out with, what is the present state of the market? I think we should back up before COVID and see where we were at before COVID hit. And where we were at was this. Um, wool production had been declining, you know, for the past 30 years around the world. And use of wool, um, you know, has, has, t has increased in, in some areas and decreased in others. And the area where it's increased is, um, is next to skin fibers and you know suiting materials and all of the finer grades is you know where wool production is in high demand it's a you know uh, a high-end fiber um, you know for high prices and the fine wool um, last year you know reached record levels um, uh, in maybe about this time last year maybe a little bit later around november it reached all-time highs and kind of was tailing off a little bit after that but um, on the other hand when we had fine wool at all-time highs we still had coarse wool at you know not all-time lows but you know certainly relatively very low especially with today's cost for handling it it, it, it is very cheap and the reason being for that is um, I guess you know nobody uses coarse wool uh, wool carpets aren't used um, you know, the wool sweater market, you know, the coarse wool sweater market, you know, if you see a sweater and it's made out of wool, it's very thin, it's, it's, and then that's typically made out of, out of fine wool fibers. Um, the old coarse, you know, uh, big knot knit is, is just not popular. When I was in college, you know, every kid in my floor in college had four or five sweaters that were, you know, you know, very thick and uh, used coarse wool that uses up a lot of coarse wool. So, um, I guess, you know, you can go to any city you want and go shopping and you know, or if you can go shopping because of COVID and it's very difficult to find a coarse wool product. So that's why the coarse wool market was so poor. So as soon as COVID hit the uh, fine wool, um, because, you know, a primary market is China and it immediately, you know, beca began declining and, uh, you know, it probably dropped at least um, in half. So it, it dropped about 50%, uh, if not actually a little bit more. And actually there were times um, from that March, April, May uh, time frame where even the fine wools were, were a difficult sell at any price, um, let alone coarse wool. I mean, you absolutely could not market coarse wool. We couldn't sell it to anyone. And uh, I don't know if you can see behind me here, here's some coarse uh, gray and black wool. It's got some black wool in it. Um, you know, that, that kind of stuff is just, is still, you know, unmarketable. Any of the, the poorer types are, are unmarketable. Um, so that leaves us, the, the, the fine wool has recovered somewhat. Um, I'm out in my factory, so we got some guys moving through here. The, uh, the fine wool has, uh, uh, you know, come back a little bit uh, from the low and is, is actually very saleable right now. And I think that's just a reflection of China is getting back to work. Um, I talk to China four or five, ten times a day, and, uh, you know, basically nobody wears a mask there. Everybody is just doing everything like normal, and they're kind of expecting uh, a normal shopping season for this fall. The rest of the world, you know, it's a different story, but, you know, with, with wool production, you know, still not great and not going up in any way, um, these next to skin and uh, fibers that can go next to skin and uh, finer wool fibers, you know, are, you know, I, I, I guess are, you know, gonna, you know, get a little stronger and, you know, could possibly, you know, get stronger yet. Um, the coarse wool, it's, it's difficult. Um, although they're marketable now, we can sell them. Um, the price is just, you know, can barely cover our, our pickup costs, our uh, grading cost and our packing cost. And, you know, we typically, when we, we like if we go to China, you know, we have to pay the shipping cost. Um, so I've kind of talked about, you know, where the value is. And I, I realized in the area that this is going to, this video is going to be shown, you know, a lot of guys have coarser wool, but there's just, there's very little, um, you know, there, there, there's very little we can do about it unless, you know, demand changes or, you know, styles change that that would be, 
you know, a, a, uh, that coarse wool would be an, a more attractive style for, you know, some type of fashion, you know, change. Um, the, and I, I did also touched on China. Uh, last year we were exporting some to Italy, but our primary um, export market is still China. You know, much of the world's uh, wool production uh, capacity still remains in China. Um, even, even though there was a trade war and it was, you know, our, our tariffs went up this year twice, um, make it, making it much more difficult to trade with China. I mean, and that was, that was our problem while, you know, the price was decent last summer is, you know, we constantly, you know, we, you know, we're ready to make a sale and then all of a sudden, you know, the tariffs would go up bec because of retaliatory action on the part of the Chinese. So that, that made it difficult, um, while, while, we, while the price was good. Um, I know that they want to know if the stimulus, you know, that uh, some of the producers uh, received uh, helped any. Well, I mean, it didn't, obviously didn't help me, but, you know, I guess, you know, you got some, uh, you know, uh, money on your wool. I, I, and, and, and I believe <clears throat> you have to have a scale ticket or a, a sales ticket for that. So it, it, it does keep people, you know, maybe selling their wool, which is a good thing because, you know, the worst thing is, especially on coarse types, you know, if you leave them in the barn until next year, you know, they yellow and uh, they get wet and they, they, they are, even if they, maybe they had even some commercial value the year before, you know, if, the, if you wait a year and say, oh, well, maybe it'll be worth something next year. And it, and it could be worth, certainly, you know, markets can always go two ways. You know, it could be worth more next year. Um, but the problem is then, you know, the quality, you know, has deteriorated. So from the, from that perspective, you know, if guys wanted to get a, a scale ticket or a sales ticket, um, to get their, um, government money, it, it was beneficial, uh, to us. So we don't, you know, we're not leaving so much on the farm. Um, the, another question they kind of wanted me to touch on, and maybe I'm not the best person to, to answer this, but, um, you know, are we importing wool into the United States? And, you know, we, we're certainly importing wool into the United States because, you know, most of the, you know, wool products that we're uh, buying, you know, we're, we're importing in, in a finished form. Um, you know, uh, so if you go buy a suit and it's a 80, 90 or 100 percent wool suit, you know, chances are that suit is going to going to have been made in, in China or somewhere in the Far East. So, you know, that's the way we import most of our wool. I mean, we do import, um, you know, because there is some clothing production left in this country. You know, and, and we do import, you know, for that, that you know, better quality um, clothing and, you know, and some of the hoseries are, like I said, next to skin um, uh, products, you know, that wool is, uh, is sourced outside of uh, the United States because we, we just pure and simply don't produce enough fine wool um, to even meet the demands of, of probably at the American, uh, you know, finer wool market. Um, and the production in the United States, I, I said that, you know, we're, we don't even produce enough for the United States um, as far as the fine wool goes. Um, and, and what does our production numbers look like? And, and I see, you know, as far, I mean, sheep numbers is, is a little bit of a difficult thing for a wool guy to tell. And that sounds kind of strange, but that's because there's so many hair breeds now that people are raising. You know, some areas it's 80% are hair breeds. So we don't know actually how many sheep we raise. But certainly wool production is, is going down. Um, you know, producers just seem to get older and older every year. And, you know, more and more people bring in their wool and say, yeah, this is the last time I'm, you know, uh, going to be bringing my wool in. I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, I'm not raising sheep anymore. My kids, you know, they, they live off the farm and, you know, we're not doing it anymore. So, you know, the sheep industry, you know, is in peril as, as far as, you know, as far as wool goes, you know, the 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 meat business you know may be a different story and i know some areas of the country um you know meat production for you know sheep is going up there's a, certainly a great ethnic market but a lot of them buy the lamb smaller and hair breeds are fine um you know they don't necessarily work for you know uh, a, a carcass that uh um you know a restaurant would want or, or the cuts that a restaurant would want but for the for the market thereafter the hair breeds are are absolutely fine so so it is uh you know it is a declining uh uh market in the united states as far as you know as, as far as the wool business it's, it's it's it gets to be a smaller pie every year so that that also you know makes things difficult you have to spread your costs over smaller and smaller uh amounts of wool um also i um was asked to touch on the pelt market a little bit and we're also in the fur business so we have a 
you know, we definitely have a good understanding of the, of the pelt business. And, uh, you know, the problem with the pelt business is, is, you know, we used to have, you know, Russia, um, China, um, you know, Korea, you know, many countries, you know, competing for these goods. And, you know, especially the Russian market was, was super hot. And that's, an, that's a market that, you know, they still favor, you know, um, you know, fur products or, you know, uh, natural products like, you know, sheepskins. But the problem is they have no money. Um, they live in an authoritarian, you know, dictatorship that, uh, you know, the, the common people just don't have any money. Whereas 10 years ago, you know, after the fall of communism, that economy was really rolling. And, uh, you know, they, they were buying sheepskin garments, you know, left and right. And the price of a pelt was, you know, sometimes eight or ten dollars when you took it to the slaughterhouse. The the benefit that you got, and now you get a, a net uh, loss when you take it to the slaughterhouse. They typically charge you for that pelt. So that that is that is also a problem, um, and we we see it in the fur business all the time. Um, I think uh, an important you know part of uh, the wool business, you know, like I said that you know we have declining uh, numbers of of uh, at least sh wool sheep um, is the sustainability um, question, and that that w what what that entails is we have a new generation of people in the entire world that are looking for sustainable products, and you know we used to look at like animal rights people or maybe that um, uh, segment of society as anti sheep, and yeah they. Um, they were, you know, they are a, a, a bit anti-sheep in that, you know, um, they don't think you should probably raise anything. But there is, has been a bit of a change, and that is, you know, with the global warming uh, going on, they are, people today, the, the younger generation, is they are so concerned with carbon production that, you know, and pollution and, you know, plastics that they, you know, if, if a sheep has to be raised and slaughtered to save the planet, that, you know, they'll do it. Well, you know, look at, you know, sheep have been around for, you know, thousands of years. You know, what a sustainable product. You know, you, you use it and, you know, if it does go into a landfill, you know, it, uh, you know, a few years and it's gone. And uh, the other thing is, is, is that product that you do buy, that, that sweater I talked about, or, you know, that wool product, you know, they typically last, you know, for, you know, years. And uh, it is the antithesis of fast fashion. And uh, I guess I, I liken it to, um, there are restaurants just right here in the Midwest, right near my, I live in Illinois, and uh, you go to them and, and they, won't, they won't give you a straw anymore, and a plastic straw. And the reason for that is, is because, you know, they, it goes in the landfill or it goes in the ocean or whatever, and they, they want to save the planet by not having that straw. Well, if you, if you look at someone that's got, you know, a, a sweatshirt on like this, um, and it's made out of 100% polyester, um, this one happens to not be made out of polyester, but if it were, you know, think about the amount of straws that are in this, you know, sweatshirt. Well, there's probably a, probably 50, or depending on how the straw is made, maybe 100. So the consumer is starting to understand that um, that this fast fashion, mostly made out of very cheap, you know, petrochemical products, is a detriment to the environment, and we are we are seeing that you know, that the consumer will, you know, will seek out products that are environmentally sustainable. And, you know, if the wool business wants to be a part of that future, which, I mean, I certainly think it can be. I mean, it's just such a, it's such a, to me, it's a no-brainer to be a part of that because you don't, you don't even have to change your product. Your product is already sustainable. Um, you're producing the, the sheep for meat, which gets, gets consumed, and every last bit of it gets consumed. It, you know, the, 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 car, the uh, eventual carcass can be rendered. Um, uh, and then the, the wool, you know, can be used and, you know, used in a long-term non-fast fashion product. And then when it is just finally discarded, it, you know, goes in a landfill and can be gone in a few years. If you throw a polyester, you know, sweater or garment into a landfill, you know, it takes thousands of years to, or I don't know uh, how many years to disintegrate, but um, it, it, it takes a very long time. And, you know, with this fast fashion, um, a, a, an interesting fact is, is that 25% of all fast fashion is never even worn by the consumer, never. So in other words, it is either discarded by the store because stores just constantly bring on new fashions, 
or the consumer buys it and they're so cheap that they don't even wear it. You know, they think, well, the fashion's already moved on. I don't even wear it. And then it just goes into a landfill. So I think that wool can be a part of this, you know, new, and I, I think that's the, actually the only true future for wool is sustainability. I think it's the only true future for everything. I think that we will, our new generation of people will look at, um, at sustainable products and they, they, they will look at every product. And is this sustainable? If it is, they'll purchase it. If it isn't, they won't. So I think the, I think the thing that we have to take away from, from this in the wool business is, is that you know, we can't be, have an adversarial relationship ship with the sort of um, uh, environmentalist. We, we actually should you know, cozy up to them and say, hey, you know, we're, we're part of the solution, we're not part of the problem. And uh, so anyway, that, that's the future that I see in, in, in the wool business. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that will, you know, dictate styles more than, you know, than anything else. And so anyway, I, um, I hope I covered, you know, most of your questions. And thank you for having me. And I'd be happy to do it again next year.